He's the long tenured voice of Belmont Park and Saratoga race course for 23 years, and he called over 80,000 races in his historic career in the United States and in Europe. Tom's a trained actor, and he did theater at St. Norbert College in DePere, Wisconsin. He appeared in many productions in college, including the title role in Molaire's Tartuffe, and major roles in Man of La Mancha, The Boyfriend, John Brown's Body, and almost a dozen other projects. He most recently appeared in the homegrown theater of Saratoga Springs as Mr. Macy and the Drunken Santa Claus in Miracle on 34th Street. <laughs> Little typecasting there. He was public Not a stretch. He was taught public speaking in the 2015 fall term at Saratoga High School Continuing Education. He's had several voiceover work roles as well in major movies, Woody Allen's The Mighty Aphrodite, all Dogs Go to Heaven, and in 2014 with Bill, Bill Murray in St. Vincent. He was the radio and TV commercial voice of the New York Racing Association from 1990 to 2014. He was also the national radio and TV voice of the Breeders' Cup commercials and promos from 1988 to 2005. For decades, he has voiced numerous TV and radio projects for the horse racing and breeding industries, and in addition to his race calling, for both ESPN and NBC Sports, he also wrote, produced, and presented feature segments. During and after his career with ESPN, NBC, and the racing industry, he has been a sought-after MC and public speaker. He's appeared on stage with the Philadelphia Orchestra on two occasions as the narrator of the horse. Makes sense, right? <laughs> so, just some of the awards that Tom has won. He's won the Eclipse Award of Merit in 2014. He won the Jockey Club Medal. He won the Big Sport of Turfdom, 2014. He won the Thoroughbred Club of America Honoree in 2015. He's on the Saratoga Race Course Walk of Fame, 2014 he was put there. The Red Smith Good Guy Award in 1995. I was also the honored camper at the Columbus Park Day Camp in 1959. <laughs> 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 Hall of Fame 2015 and Thoroughfan Man of the Year in 2016. I have the utmost respect for Tom. I've always looked up to him. He's been one of my role models. And ladies and gentlemen, here he is, the legendary Tom Burke. Thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll try with this for a while. I, I don't think I need this. If, if you can't hear me, uh, then go see an ear doctor, but I should be able to, should be able to, can you hear me in the back well enough? Yeah, not a problem. Okay, good. Uh, thank you for that introduction, uh, Sean. Uh, I listened to it and I think I must be pretty damn old to have done all that stuff, <laughs> uh, which is the case. But welcome uh, 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 to our evening together. Uh, it's always nice to be back in, and I'll get this right, Louisville. <laughs> Many people think there are three or four syllables in Louisville. There are not. There are two, Lo and Lo. And they all come from here. So if I get Louisville wrong, come and get me. Uh, so uh, it's uh, a pleasure to be, uh, to be here for the uh, equine industry program. Um, it's part of the business school and that's really appropriate. Uh, because horse racing is a business. And if you were to go on Wall Street and try to figure out where horse racing falls in the realm of businesses, where we're not manufacturers, we're not in finance, uh, gosh, we're not in telecommunications, horse racing comes under the purview of entertainment. And beneath that, it is a gambling entertainment of all the different types of entertainment there is. And my job as an announcer is to kind of punch that entertainment value up a little bit. Uh, now you guys are going to school here, some of you, uh, for very different reasons in the racing game. There's marketing and uh, there's racing secretaries and there's uh, mutual people, there's regulators, there's all sorts of things, veterinarians, all sorts of stuff. But my end of the game was entertainment. And I tried to make it fun. But you gotta be a little careful there because people are betting their money and they don't want you to make too many jokes about it. This is not my first 
visit to this program. I think it was about 2002. Uh, I was working for ESPN on the Derby Show, and uh, my producer said, okay, I want you to explain dosage. Does everybody here know what dosage is? Okay, uh, dosage is this crackpot uh, look at breeding, and they try to come down with a mathematical number to tell you whether your horse can win the Kentucky Derby. If it's under a certain number, I think the number is three, uh, then you can win the Kentucky Derby. If not, you have no chance. Now, this dosage theory really caught on at that time. Everybody believed it because these, all these horses that had dosage numbers won the Derby. The problem was they came up with the dosage number after they knew the results. And you can come up, you couldn't come up with 20 winners in a row with that kind of, of uh, thinking. And so my, my producer says, we need you to explain dosage. It's a very dry subject. And I go, okay, but I'm going to explain it my way. And first of all, I want you to know, I think it's a bunch of hooey. And he goes, I don't care, just explain it. They want people that ask, they want to know what dosage is. I said, okay, fine, but I'm going to do it my way. Let's roll the tape. This was done at the University of Louisville. You're about to go to school. In our quest for the Derby winner, we turn to academia, science, to the dosage theory, that arcane abstraction of equine genetics and mathematics that unfittingly projects the Derby winner each year. We go to the hallowed halls of higher learning for the explanation where the eager and hoping minds of youth search for the answers. Good morning, class. Dosage theory is based on a list of influential sires called chefs de race. Why are they called chefs de race instead of influential sires? It sounds better. Now, take notes. Questions later. Chefs de race are classified into five different categories. It is brilliant, intermediate, classic, solid, or professional, depending on their ability to either pass on speed and precociousness or stamina and maturity. Speed on the left, stamina on the right. Classic covers both categories. It is in the middle. The higher the dosage index number, the more speed. That is, the less likely a horse will be able to last the longer distances of races such as the Kentucky Derby. And now, my dear students, time now to arrive at the all-important dosage index number. My aide, Miss Fletcher, is sister of man. <laughs> Here is the four-generation pedigree of Derby runner Hello. In dosage theory, we assign 16 points to the chef de race that appears in the first generation. Sorry, Lysias is not. Eight points to each chef de race in the second generation. Mr. Prospector, a chef de race, qualifies in two categories. Four points for the brilliant, four points for the classic. In the third generation, we assign four points for each chef de race. Are you with me, class? <laughs> and in the fourth generation, two points for each chef de race that appears in the pedigree. Adding those points to the respective categories, we total the points in each category. Well done, Flesh because the classic category is both speed and stamina, we split those numbers. Now, to arrive at the dosage index number, we divide the points from the speed wing, which total 19 and a half, by the 6 and a half points from the stamina wing. There it is. Hello's dosage index is 3.0. He qualifies to win the dirt. Questions? Yes, Periwinkle. What if a horse's sire isn't a chef to race? Too bad. <laughs> Did we do? Every horse has a sire and a dam. Don't females count in dosage? No. Mr. Waterpick, strike the gold when the baby with the dosage of man for Isn't that too high? Ah, but he qualifies now, Waterpick. We just made his sire, Alidar, a chef de race. Then the math changes. Voila, a dosage qualifier. Under the magic mark, a four point dose. We'll do the straight ending zero here. Think it's voodoo, think it's witchcraft. <laughs> He said it was a statistical anomaly. Does dosage work as well for the Pregnus and the Belmont? No. But that's all the time for today. Your assignment is to pick the winner of the Kentucky Derby using the dosage theory. Class dismissed. And so we leave the Ivy Covered Institute well assured of yet another Derby winner. Genetics.
that's the kind of stuff I like about horse racing. You can have fun. <laughs> And it, let's, let's make it fun, let's make it entertaining. And, and that's what I, you know, it's not, fun is not always happy, ha ha. Part of entertainment and being entertaining, drama certainly fits in, into that category. Um, as an announcer, the, if they didn't really have announcers, uh, race callers until the mid 30s. And that's when they first started putting public address systems into racetracks. Well, that's about the time that Keeneland opened up. And as you know, in uh, Keeneland, they do things very traditionally. And they didn't think it was very traditional to have a race caller. So they didn't put one in until 1986. That's the way Keeneland does things. And fine, they kept an announcer out of work for quite a while. Um, and, and, and the announcers, because we were engaged in a, in a gambling business. The announcers, for the longest time, had to be this voice of God, this kind of neutral voice that, as if we don't really care about gambling. This is a sport, and this is the way I'm going to conduct myself. And over the period of time, that kind of changed. Uh, and so when I first started working, they didn't even want you to call the finish. Now imagine that, having a horse race and not calling the finish. Now you could do it on TV and you could do it on the radio, but at the track, many, many tracks, not until maybe the late 80s, 90, didn't want you to call the finish. I remember the day uh, I went to Aqueduct for the 1985 uh, Breeders' Cup. Uh, it was at Aqueduct and the regular announcer uh, took the day off because I was gonna be the guy calling the races on Breeders' Cup Day on the public address system. So one of the assistants announcers, not assistant announcers was there the day before, and so he um, showed me how to turn on and off the switch, and they let me call a race. So I'm calling the race, and he's standing in the back of the booth. And they're coming down to the finish, and I go, here's the wire, and it's, and this guy heroically dives across the room and you know, like, it's like something in slow motion, he's going, no, you can't call me free. I said, what the hell are you doing? You can't do that. It's, I'll never forget this, it's, it's ipso facto. Okay, fine. Uh, but I think like to think that we've come uh, a long way since uh, the first announcers started calling races. But again, you gotta be careful with this uh, sense of humor involved. Uh, people are betting. And so I, I went very gingerly going into uh, being humorous on there. I didn't do it very often, but I was very careful when I did it. Sometimes you just can't resist. Why don't you roll this tape? <laughs> and they're off. And it's Feline Fun who breaks on top. That cat right there on the outside with Feline Fun. Five Demon Bad comes out running in third. On the inside, Matt Hope comes out racing in fourth. And in between horses, Spider Rock now in fifth position on the far outside, stand back, races six. That's the Yankees is now seven, followed by Unbridled Wish in eight. Ah! It is now nine. As for is on the evening. Into the far turn, Hep Cat and Feline Felon, Hep Cat. Hep Cat up for the lead. Hep Cat in front, Feline Felon second. Here is Stan Pat now charging. Third on the outside, that's it. It is now fourth. Five demon bag, fifth toward the inside, and then it is a spider rock, followed by R on the outside. <laughs> Coming to the top of the stretch, Hep Cat the leader. Hep Cat in front, but here's Stan Pat. Stan Pat up to challenge for that lead as they field turns for home. Matt's wish on the outside runs in third. Then down toward the inside, it's Phil and Phil in fourth. In the middle of the track is Ah! <laughs> Coming down to the final 16th, it is Stan Pat in front. Ah! Ah! in front, coming down to the water. They're coming to the finish, and it's all. Ah! <laughs> 
so, you know, they give you a game like that, a name like that to work with. What the hell are you going to do? Let it go? <laughs> there was a horse called Yaka Hickamikadola. Oh, no. <laughs> and so, you name a horse Yaka Hickamikadola, you're obviously trying to trip up the announcer. So, fine, I'll give it to you. This was back in the 80s at Hialeah. So, they're off, and I go, and. Hickamola Dilla Dola is first. Blah, 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 blah. Down the back stretch. Yaka Moka Hilla Dilla. Then Dick and Maka Raka Maka Jacob Rika Waka Hola Cola. And just calling them the stupidest names all the way around the track. And you can get away with that only once in a while. Just to give you an idea about um, that particular race, uh, 600,000 people uh, uh, had YouTube views for this year's uh, Belmont Stakes. 600,000. Arg, two million. <laughs> uh, a little bit about my career path. Uh, I, I, I just always wanted to be a racetrack announcer, and I started uh, in my neighborhood calling my buddies running around the parking lot. And then in college, when I got, oh, by the way, you were talking about my college career. I graduated from college on May 12th this year. Fifty years after I started, <laughs> I became the oldest graduate at age 68 of St. Norbert College in De Pere, Wisconsin. I was two courses short, so I went back. Now you'd think, like, you know, two courses short, well, I went there for four years and came up a little short. I went there for five and a half years <laughs> and still didn't graduate. Not a great academic record. But, you know, I am a record holder, oldest guy ever from the school. Uh, but anyway, so at, in college, I would uh, call these races with, I'd get on top of the bar, and my friends would run around the bar, and I'd call them, and blah, 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 blah. We'd bet quarters and nickels, and I'd call the race. And everybody knew I wanted to be a racetrack announcer. It's all I ever wanted to do growing up. I wanted to be Pope for a while. And then, because I figured it'd be a pretty cool job being Pope. And uh, then I realized there was this celibacy thing involved, and that, that cut out uh, any, any thought of the priesthood for me. Uh, so, uh, anyway, so uh, I got this career, and it's all based on a lie. It's all based on a complete, total lie. Uh, back in 1972, people actually hitchhiked to get around, and my buddy was coming up from Chicago to visit me in, in uh, Green Bay, where I was going to school. Guy picks him up, they start talking, this guy's running county fairs in Wisconsin, and says, my buddy Tom Durkin is the assistant track announcer at Arlington Park, and maybe he might like to call those races at the county fairs. He goes, assistant track announcer, that's great, we'll hire him. So, I get the job. My buddy never told me that he told him that I was the assistant announcer at Arlington Park. I was introduced as the assistant announcer at Arlington Park on my first day of work. There is no assistant announcer at Arlington Park, and it certainly wasn't me. So this great career of mine has been based on a complete and total lie. I started working out at these, uh, called, working out, no, I've never done that. Uh, I started working at these county fairs in Wisconsin. Purses were $200 and things like that. Um, so, you know, to make a little extra money, we did a couple things. First of all, they, the, the, all these little towns in Wisconsin, Anago, Tom, Anago, by the way, hometown of uh, Wayne Lucas of all people, a uh, little fair track up there in Toma, Fond du Lac, all these little places. So each of these towns has uh, invariably an A&W drive-in or something like that. And the night before the races, we'd kind of go down to the A&W, and there's nothing to do in these little towns uh, except drive your you know, fancy car through if you've got one. So we, we'd stop these guys that th thought they had the fastest car in town and said, how'd you like to run that car against a horse on Sunday at the track f at the county fair? Yeah, my, my Corvette could beat a horse. Are you kidding me? So what we would do, we, and we'd bet these guys in town, we'd set the starting gig up, get a quarter horse in there, and then we'd put the, the guy in the Corvette or whatever car he had in the deep part of the track. It was about this deep. <laughs> and I'd get up there and I'd do this routine. It's 350 horsepower against one horse, the power of one horse. The flesh of the animal, the sinew, the muscle against the mighty steel from Detroit. I'm just going on and on and on and on. And they're off, and we cashed every week. Um, <laughs> and then also we had betting. Uh, it was called. Um, oh, comes a uh, 
It was like an auction uh, betting system. We didn't have paramutual betting, obviously. And so what you would do, you would uh, get a group and you'd auction off a horse. And if you uh, bid the most of anybody there, that would be your horse for that race and whatever. It's kind of like betting. So this is when I was first there. And so we would gather behind a barn and start this auction. And the guy that led the auction was a guy named Franny Flum. And he was uh, uh, not a, what, uh, from Lancaster, uh, Pennsylvania, not a Quaker, but a, uh, an Amish. And he had that real severe Amish look, you know, with the hat that only Gary Cooper look, could look good in, and then the severe Amish beard going down. So he's conducting the, the uh, auction. And then all of a sudden, these little kids right in the middle of the auction go, Franny, 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 are they coming? And he goes, okay, folks, okay, folks. And so everybody is silent, and he goes, okay, let's go. And he starts singing Rock of Ages. And the police were coming. Little kids would look out for the police, and if the police came, we turned the whole thing in from a betting venue into a religious ceremony. <laughs> Nobody ever went to jail. But those were great fun times, uh, and, and I got some work at, at little tracks uh, along the way, uh, Cahokia Downs in East St. Louis, which at the time was the Myrtle capital of America, thank you. And um, that was just fun. One night we couldn't have the races because overnight somebody stole the rail. <laughs> <laughs> rail was made of aluminum, I stole the rail. <laughs> Uh, I remember one night, uh, I had a real uh, nervous boss, Jack Weaver, great guy. So I'm out there in the announcer's booth, and he goes, Tom, 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 Tom. Oh, we, we got to send everybody away. We, we, there's been a bomb scare at the switchboard, and we, we just, we just got to send everybody out of the building. I go, okay, Jack, okay, I can do that. And I go, but like, let's, let's do this calm, let's do this cool. He goes, okay, all right, all right, all right, yeah, okay, write it down, what are you going to say? And I'm going to say, ladies and gentlemen, we have received a threatening call at the switchboard. We do not consider this serious. However, in the interest of public safety, we ask you now to leave the building. So that's good, that's good, that's good, Tom. And I go, so I go through it. In the interest of public, and so I turn on the microphone, go through the thing and say, and in the interest of public safety, and Jack's out there sweating bullets, please leave the building. Then I turned off the microphone and said, run for your lives, this place is blowing sky high! <laughs> I thought Jack was gonna have a heart attack that night. <laughs> uh, but a real break uh, came with me, uh, got hired to do the Breeders' Cup 1984, it was November 10th, 1984 at Hollywood Park. The original purpose of the Breeders' Cup was to have this great, gigantic, massive sporting event that would get people tuned in. They had to, you had to watch it. It was that big. You had to watch it. It was like because you have to watch the Super Bowl, you have to watch the World Series, or the Stanley Cup. Horse racing didn't have anything like that. There was no championship. And so they, these races, you have to understand, there might have been two $1 million races in 1984, uh, maybe the Derby and the Arlington Million. We had seven. One of them was a $3 million race, one of them was a $2 million race. This was unbelievable. So NBC paid a lot of money to put the Breeders' Cup on, and the thought was this would be a way of getting horse racing out to the general public, that this would be something that they would watch, and they'd get excited about horse racing. Uh, the ratings, it never turned out to be a ratings uh, hit, never. Uh, but it developed in different ways. For instance, uh, this year's Derby rating was uh, 9.4. Uh, Breeders' Cup last year was 1.4. However, Breeders' Cup developed into a great business model. The original, I think I got it written down here, uh, the original handle on opening Breeders' Cup Day was $19 million. $19 million. Last year was $163 million. So it's developed into different ways. And that first Breeders' Cup was, people didn't quite know what to make of it. Because at that point, we always crowned our champions with votes. There was no definitive championship at all. And so this was a, a defining event. 
for horse racing. But, but nobody really kind of had it figured out going in. But coming out of that day, boy, we absolutely did. Uh, and, and we started a real effort to improve turf racing in America and make it an international event. We had a race called uh, the Breeders' Cup Mile. It was on the turf. And everybody's going, well, what, what is that doing here? We don't do mile races on the turf. We don't say. There were no sprint races on the turf at that time. Two-year-old races, maybe in the fall. But it went a long way in developing, in developing that and bringing horses from uh, Europe to come over to America. And uh, the Breeders' Cup turf was a $2 million race. And I did a spot on there on the TVs. Why, you know, why, these, why would all these horses come over from Europe? I mean, at the time, the Arc de Triomphe itself, which is the greatest race in Europe, was only $500,000. And somebody asked me, so why, you know, why do they come all the way over here? And I said, they have two million reasons. Each one of them has a picture of George Washington on the front of it. <laughs> and so it didn't quite develop into what they thought it was. There were some. Uh, Unintended consequences, uh, the Breeders' Cup really decimated the races at uh, Belmont Park and the Belmont Park Fall Meeting, where many of the great championships were decided. The distances of the races had to change. Uh, the timing on, of the year when the races were had to change to go with the Breeders' Cup. Uh, and I don't think to the benefit of the breed, if I can be uh, frank. Uh, the Breeders' Cup disc staff was a mile and a quarter originally. And they cut it back to a mile and an eighth. Now, because they thought they could get more horses going a mile and an eighth than a mile and a quarter. I mean, what did that do to improve the breed? And the Jockey Club Gold Cup, which went from two miles to a mile and a half, and you couldn't have a mile and a half prep race for a mile and a quarter Breeders' Cup Classic. So that race was back down, diminished. Now the breed is not as sturdy as it was. Uh, whatever reason you want to look at, the gene pool is very, very small. 80% of the horses that are running now are descendants of Native Dancer, who is not particularly sound. That is a very, very narrow gene pool. And so much of the blood are descendants of Mr. Prospector. Huge numbers of horses are now descendants of Mr. Prospector. He raced twice. So there's a lot of blood that's not particularly sound, not a lot of stamina there. Mr. Prospector was clearly a sprinter. And the Breeders' Cup, I'm not laying at their feet at all, but uh, there have been some consequences uh, of it that are all not 100% great, but we couldn't exist without the Breeders' Cup. Uh, the, let me uh, get a glass of water here. It's not gin, don't worry, folks. Ooh. Um, the first Breeders' Cup, now you gotta imagine, I'm two years out from being that announcer at Cahokia Downs, okay? And my name in the announcing world at that time was Tom Who. So anyway, I'm just jazzed up. And I got this, first time I ever took a air, airplane uh, in uh, first class, and I thought that was, uh, well, I'm quite the man right now. And I had this, uh, credential that said Tom Durkin, NBC Sports, and basically let him go wherever he wants. So I used to go through this routine every year from uh, uh, Labor Day to Breeders' Cup Day. I wanted to be on my very best behavior. I wanted to be clear thinking. I wanted all the energy that I could possibly have. So religiously for 24 years, uh, from Labor Day to Breeders' Cup Day, I did not take a drink. I I even resorted to exercise, can you imagine? <laughs> and eating healthy, really, really severe. I mean, uh, usually my, uh, you know, and at that time, my body was a temple for that, those two months a year. The rest of the time, it was the temple of doom. <laughs> but anyway, so here I am of opening Breeders' Cup Day, and I got my credentials, says go wherever you want, Tom. I haven't had a drink since Labor Day, so I'm going to go to a party, find some beer, and guzzle it down. So I gather all my bags, my notes, and my, and my binoculars, and, and I go looking for a party. And I look in this room, and it looks like there's a party. I can go anywhere I want. So uh, I see this guy's obviously a security guard. You know, he's got the thing coming out and talking. I don't remember, but okay. So can you watch my stuff here? I'm just going to go over to the bar, get a couple beers, and I'll be right back. He goes, yeah, yeah, go ahead. But if my man wants to go, I gotta go. 
I said, okay, who's your man? He points over my shoulder. I turn around. President Gerald R. Ford. <laughs> then I look in the room. Is that Elizabeth Taylor? Frank Sinatra? Cary Grant, Merv Griffin, Zsa, Zsa Gabor, Fred Astaire, they're all in this room and I'm in the same room with them, guzzling down beers. So at that time there were no phones at the racetrack, there were certainly no cell phones, so I gotta tell somebody about this. So I knew there was a phone in the racing secretary's office, so I go downstairs, go to the racing secretary, can I use your phone for just a second? Yeah, go ahead, Tom, here you go. Mom, you cannot believe who I'm partying with. <laughs> That was the most memorable, that might have been the most memorable moment of my life, but it certainly, uh, that first Breeders' Cup day, uh, clearly uh, was so important to me. Uh, it still doesn't top the Triple Crown in terms of uh, grabbing the fancy of the general public, uh, but there's nothing like an attempt for the Triple Crown. There's no, nothing in sports that can compare to that energy, that moment when the horses arrive at the top of the stretch at Belmont Park and one of them might become a Triple Crown winner. Nine times, nine <laughs> times, I walked into the announcer's booth at Belmont Park with the opportunity to walk away calling a Triple Crown winner. It'd be right there on my gravestone. Here lies Tom Durkin. He called a triple crown winner. Nine times. Oh, four nine. So my contract was supposed to go through the year 2015 at Naira. And uh, usually uh, come springtime, I'm, I'm ready to go, you know. I really want to, I took the winters off that time. Went over to Italy, put my feet up on uh, on a crate of wine bottles and finish them down. And, um, and but then, you know, but when come March, I always wanted to really get back to work. <laughs> Let's go back to work, I can't wait. But that year, it just, it just wasn't feeling it. And um, <laughs> I thought, you know what? Screw it, let's see if I can get out of my last year. Because I, I don't want to go in that booth not feeling 100% and really having the energy and the enthusiasm and the uh, determination to do my best. So I went to Naira and they said, okay, Tom, you know, we don't want you to do it, but okay, you know, we'll let you out. And, and uh, they said, can my last day be at Saratoga? Yeah, sure, fine. So that was my last year, 2014. Larry Colmus walked into the booth. <laughs> called a triple crown winner. <laughs> He's called two so far. He's only been there three years. <laughs> but that moment when they get to the top of the stretch, let's take a look at the 1998 Belmont Stakes. And they're off in the 130th Belmont Stakes. And Real Quiet's run for a triple crown. He came away to an uneventful start. And it is Chili Hill, as expected, who is going out for the early lead. For the outside, Ramsey's Majesty is showing some speed today. Grand Slam is 3 1 and running in third position. Then it out runs up close to the pace in fourth. And Real Quiet's not too far away from the early lead. He's in behind horses running in fifth position. Yarrow Bray is just to his outside. Thomas Joe is running in seventh. Basic trainee is a parade round ninth. And Victory Gallop is tenth on the outside. The early trailer is Classic Cat as the field makes their way toward that long run down the Belmont backstretch. And it's Chili Hill and he's breezing along through a quarter that went to 23 and 3 fifth seconds. And a 48 and 3 opening half mile. The pace here is slow to develop. Grand Slam second on the outside. Limit out is running room at the rail. Right up there running in third. Yarrow Bray is fourth. Rafi's Majesty is running in fifth position. Kent DeSormo has guided the Derby winner and the Preakness winner real quiet to the outside for a clear shot at the lead as they continue midway down the backstretch. And he's moving early with six furlongs to go. Then farther back in the field, it's Thomas Joe Parade Run. 
Victory Gallop is 10 lengths from the lead as Real Quiet now makes a powerful run to the lead with five furlongs to go. Three quarters in one, 13 and two. And the field moving into the far turn. It is still Cholito in front. Grand Slam trying to get by him. Real Quiet is in perfect striking position. He is third with three and a half furlongs to run. A break of five lengths. Raffi's Majesty is full out. He's running in fourth. Thomas Joe moves to fifth. Three furlongs from the wire. Real Quiet is making a bid for the lead. Cholito toward the inside. Grand Slam is in between those two. Five lengths to Thomas Joe. Raffi's Majesty toward the inside. Victory Gallop is six lengths from the lead, but he's gathering momentum. And as they arrive at the top of the stretch, Real Quiet is taking the lead. He's coming to the eight pole. 20 years in the waiting. One furlong to go. But here comes his rival, Victory Gallop, as they come to the final 60. Ken DeSormo imploring Real Quiet to hold on. Victory Gallop, a final surge. It's going to be very close. Here's the winner. It's too close to call. Was it Real Quiet or was it Victory Gallop? A picture is worth a thousand words. This photo is worth five million dollars. Also, history in the waiting on hold till we get that photo finished. Uh, so that year, Chrysler sponsored, or was it Chrysler or Visa? Uh, they sponsored the Triple Crown, and if you won all three, you got $5 million. And Bob Baffert did not get a $5 million check that day. Uh, so people, you know, so when I said there, um, a picture's worth a thousand words, that picture's worth $5 million, people asked me, well, did you think of that before? Yes, yes, I did. Uh, and the business about history on hold. Did you think of that before? No, no, I didn't. It doesn't really work like that. You, you study and you try to come up with all sorts of different uh, iterations as what, to, could hap what could happen in the race. And I'm thinking, well, you know, uh, uh, if there's a photo, oh, well, yeah, if it's really close, it could be, it's a $5 million photo, not a picture worth a thousand. And you just start with these, these things and they grow and they develop. Uh, but sometimes you, 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 it doesn't work for you. You kind of have to uh, keep it in the moment. And I'll talk about that in just a little bit. Uh, but I had a book, uh, a notebook, and I think I did a word count on it on the computer one time. It was about 1,500 words, and it's words that I would use in describing horse races. Uh, and you want to make it sound good. If you sound bad, and if you don't sound interesting, people don't listen. So you got to make it sound good and sound interesting. And you don't do that by saying, oh, that was a fast half mile. I had 50 words for fast. Grueling, excruciating, torrid. I had 50 words for slow, from tepid to somnambulant. <laughs> All the words between. And so I just tried to jam all those words. I read that book almost every day before I went into work. Uh, well, not the whole book. I, 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 I devoted 45 minutes to it every day. And the book got so long, it took longer than 45 minutes to read the whole damn thing. But I, I was making entries into that book, and I would write the date of the entry that I found a new word, a new idea, a new expression a new way of looking things, and I just jot down the date. And I made entries into that book uh, every day until my last day uh, in 2014. Um, you do prepare these lines to a certain degree, but not always. Now, when uh, being a drama major, I, I looked at these races as dramas, stories to tell. Uh, there were characters, and those were the horses, and there were protagonists, those were the favorites, and antagonists, those were the horses that tried to beat the favorite. There were storylines, and those lines were in the past performances uh, in the daily racing form. Those, that was the storyline. And then you had to come up with 25 words or less just in your mind, what's this race about? And then you determine what the uh, main uh, theme of this drama would be, if you will, and then you write out the possible scenes and possible scenarios. 
Does the horse get loose on the lead? How fast is he going? Is he going too fast in that race? I was very uh, clear when Kent DeSormo moved at six furlongs, I was very clear to say Kent DeSormo is moving early. Six furlongs is early. But I did not say Kent DeSormo is moving too soon. There's a big difference between those two words. Now, Kent DeSormo loses the photo by this much. People start saying, he moved too soon, he moved too soon. If he wins the photo by, wins the photo by this much, it was the most brilliant, brilliantly timed move in the history of horse racing. You can't win sometimes when you're a jockey. Um, so I, I look at these things in terms of plot and narrative. In, when you're betting on horse races, you're very uh, uh, keen on the narrative. So the narrative is uh, secretary at his first, affirmed his second, Seattle slew his third. That's the narrative. It becomes plot when you say Secretariat is first, affirmed is second, Seattle slew is third. And it becomes plot when you say only one of those three Triple Crown winners will win. So there's a difference between plot and narrative. And as a race caller, this is something that you have to do. So stepping back a bit, uh, getting into this words uh, that I used and, and trying to come up with a better word, uh, not a mundane uh, word, if you will, some sort of quotidian uh, word that, you know, people are going to forget. So Cigar, it's 1995, Cigar is coming to the Breeders' Cup Classic and he's going to attempt to retire, un, not retire, but win 11 races uh, in that year to go out of, with an undefeated season that year. He would go on to win 16 in a row, by the way. Uh, but this was his last race of the year, the Breeders' Cup Classic. It was his uh, 11th victory that year. So I wanted to, you know, undefeated, that's a pretty ordinary word as far as I'm concerned. So I wanted to have a bunch of words that I could say other than undefeated. So, you know, I went through my head, went through the thesaurus, which was a great uh, great help to me. And so, uh, unconquerable, that's undefeated, okay. Invincible, all right. Unbeatable, that's another word for, okay. So let's see what happens. In the gate, for the 12th Breeders Cup Classic. And they're off. French deputy Star Standard strikes up for the lead immediately, and he is aggressively ridden here. Star Standard to the lead, and Cigar is keyed up today. Very competitive, and he's right up there close for the inside Le Carrier. They make the bend toward the back stretch. Star Standard leads, Le Carrier pressing on the inside. Jerry Bailey with a hard hold of the pent up power of Cigar, restrained in third. Peaks and Valleys in the clear on the outside fourth. Unaccounted for is fifth. French deputy from off the pace today. England's hauling is now seventh on the outside. Tinner's Way is next. Then it's Soul of the Matter who's down on the fence about nine lengths from the lead. Jed Forrest and Concern is just where he was last year at this time. Last about a dozen lengths from the front. The opening quarter went to 24 and one fifth seconds. Star standard on the outside. The carrier pressing for the lead with six furlongs to go. And Cigar wants to go to the lead, but Jerry Bailey says no, not yet. Unaccounted for fourth toward the rail with five furlongs to run. The opening half mile went to 48 and one fifth seconds. So the better now has to pick it up, but he threads his way through it between horses. Then far the back, it's French deputies, only three and a half lengths from the lead, then pigs and valleys, followed by Hauling. A break of green and jet force followed by Tinner's way. Concern is still last. Three for long to go. Cigar! Cigar makes his move and he sweeps to the lead with a dramatic rush with three for longs to go. And Jerry Bailey turns him loose and he guides him down to the rail as the field turns for home. On a concord down inside, a quarter of a mile between Cigar and a perfect season coming down to the last round.
car. So as the race uh, transpired, they're coming down to the finish, and he's going to win, and I just had plenty of time to say unconquerable, invincible, unbeatable, instead of using just one of them. So that's the way it turns out uh, sometimes. Um, but you have to prepare, but you can't be um, married to any sort of uh, scenario, said the 68-year-old bachelor. Um, <laughs> You can't, really, it's a horse race. Anything can, can really happen. Uh, you, but you have to stay in the moment as well, as well as being prepared. So the object is to just shove all this stuff into your un unconscious mind. And, and I did a lot of hypnosis uh, over the years, and it really, uh, it really, I'll, I'll tell you a story here of what happened in Louisville one year. Um, it was the Breeders' Cup 1988, or 89, 88. And um, so I had been going to this uh, psychiatrist and getting hypnotized uh, because I would get really nervous and whatever, but I wanted uh, to just have those words come and not get, uh, the worst thing that can happen to an announcer is he gets nervous and you can't breathe and uh, you're screwed, totally screwed. So I didn't want to be nervous, and I wanted those words to float up from my subconscious, and I wanted to, to elocute them. So the guy goes, okay, you know, you're going into a deep sleep. And he asked me beforehand if there was anything that I would be around near the announcer's booth that, would, that I would see. And I said, yeah, an announcer, it's a church announcer, they got... Uh, uh, the Twin Spires, very famous, iconic. And it's right there by where I am. It's okay. So he hypnotizes me, and that's my hypnotic clue. When I see those Twin Spires, I'm to think, the words will come to you easily. You will not get so excited that you will not be able to breathe. It'll be a wonderful thing for you, Tom the sight of those twin spires. The words will come easily. You'll breathe well. You'll be confident, whatever. So, <clears throat> Breeders' Cup day comes. Here we go, I'm, I'm, I'm set. Stay at the Hyatt downtown. Open up the window, the screen. It's raining sideways. The worst thing that can happen to an announcer at Churchill Downs is rain because the mud splashes up on the horses. They all get to be the same color. You can't tell one from another, and I'm totally screwed. <laughs> so I'm walking down, walking down the car, taking me out there, and I'm walking to the gallows. Uh, my life is over. So we go up uh, Third Street, I guess. We turn right down Central. And then I look up. There's those twin spires. Let's go get them, Tommy Boy! You can do this! And it really, really was, it worked. And that was one of the greatest days ever uh, in horse racing. I think it was on my game, too, that day. It was, uh, oh, Personal Ensign won that day. Um, the Esk won two years in a row that day. The Midnight Classic, Ali Sheba wins because the richest horse in the world, Cordero won a race that day. Wayne Lucas won three or four. And then the Philly, uh, two-year-old Philly race, he finished one, two, three, four. This is, this is crazy. It was just a, a, a great and wonderful day. But you have to stay in the moment, as I said. You can't get married to anything. And you have to take things as they happen. So uh, I'm going to show you Rachel Alexander here, Alexander here in the uh, Woodward Stakes. Um, at the Saratoga. Uh, if you remember, Rachel Alexander had won the Kentucky Oaks by 20 and a quarter lengths. She won the Preakness. She was a Philly now. Won the Preakness. She beat the three-year-old boys in the Haskell. She won the Mother Goose, and she won uh, the Acorn, I guess. And she had nothing to prove against certainly three-year-old Phillies, nothing to prove against the three-year-old coach who beat them. So she goes against the older horses. Now, Rachel Alexandra, uh, I mean, she was really a fan favorite. And up at Saratoga, they loved her. 
Uh, they had banners all up and down Broadway in Saratoga. It said, go Rachel Alexandra, run like a girl. Uh, and we're gonna, I'm gonna show you that race. Um, well, let's just run the race and, and then I'll uh, tell you about being in the moment. They're in the gate. And they're off. Past the point on the outside, the tear down toward the rail. Rachel Alexander is right up there with them. And cool Coleman on the outside. So they race into the first turn here. Rachel Alexander will duel with Daterra. On the far outside, past the point is right there. And in behind, cool Coleman. A break of three, back to It's a Bird, another in three. Back to Bulls Bay, who's on hold early on here. Asiatic Boy, and another seven to Macho again, who trailed the field. Oh, the first quarter was 22 and four fifth seconds. There'll be no free ride for Rachel Alexandra. They're making her work for every step today. The Terra has sent her through a punishing opening quarter mile. Past the point on the outside, runs along in third. In behind the cool, oh man, is fourth. It's a bird fifth on the outside in Bulls Bay. 46 and two was the half mile. Calvin Burrell was able to slow that pace down just a little bit, but they move into the far turn. There's a half mile to go. Rachel Alexandra still holding that lead. Has the point trying to get to her. The lead is now a length on the inside. It is Cole Coleman running in third. It's a bird is fourth. Asiatic boy is launching a bit from the back of the pack. And Macho again is firing two. They're coming to the top of the stretch. It is still the Philly in front. A dramatic stretch drive awaits in the Woodward Stakes. On the outside, here is Bulls Bay. And Calvin Morello pouring his Philly for more. And Rachel Alexandra holds on to the lead. Bulls Bay is second. Macho again is making a tremendous run for the back of the pack. Rachel Alexandra, Macho again. They're coming down to the finish. It's going to be desperately close. Here's the warrior. Rachel won. She is indeed Rachel Alexandra, the great, beating Macho again here. And for the bet, Bulls Bay was third. The time was 148-1. and one. Rachel Alexandra raises the rafters here at the spa. So if you were there that day, uh, you literally felt the building shake. Uh, that business about raising the rafters, that was never in my, my book, uh, nothing I anticipated. But I actually felt the building shake. It, it's a 100 and some year old building, wood, timbers, and whatever, and the force of people screaming their lungs out forced all the molecules you, you listen by air molecules moving into your ear and they get accepted by receptors of what you think of a sound. Anyway, but it's all the matter of force pushing. That's why a big slap sounds a lot louder than a little slap. It's the force that sends that, uh, those molecules through the air. The molecules hit the wood columns and made the place shake. And that's being in the moment. You can't plan for that sort of stuff. Uh, in your careers, when you're going to go out uh, and have business meetings and whatever, uh, you obviously you have to be prepared, but just stay in the moment in the meeting. Uh, inspiration is part of anybody's job. Um, I'm going to talk about religion very briefly here. Uh, the angel Gabriel uh, was. Uh, an important figure in three religions, the Christian religion, the Jewish faith, and Islam. And so if there's any Catholics in the room, you know uh, the Arch Archangel Gabriel's famous words, and if you're Catholic, you've said them many, many times, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Those were the words of, of the angel Gabriel saying to her, Hail Mary, hey Mary, how you doing? She was there praying or something, I don't know. And he comes out from heaven, hey, Mary, how you doing? And uh, blessed are you among women. And by the way, you're pregnant, and Jesus is going to be your baby. So fast forward about 500 years uh, to the prophet Muhammad. And the angel Gabriel is a figure in that religion as well. It's the same guy. We all, the three religions, uh, worship the same deity. And so 
He's out in the desert, Muhammad, trying to figure out things. And Angel Gabriel comes to him, and he says, hello, Muhammad, you know, and Muhammad goes, oh, man, I'm just trying to figure out what, what advice would you give me? And the angel Gabriel responded with one word, read. And that was it. My advice to all you students is read. This is where your inspiration will come from. Your inspiration is not going to come from sitting on your ass watching a video game. Okay, you've got to go out there and find inspiration. And that inspiration is pretty much in books, any kind of book. And I, I read a lot of different stuff, most of which had nothing to do with calling a horse race. But I got certain ideas, certain inspiration. Inspiration is a catalyst to make you do a good job, to make you be creative. Inspiration is that catalyst that makes you be successful by going beyond what is the norm. So I would read uh, books about anything. You don't know where inspiration is going to come from. So I happen to be reading a book about music. Uh, David Byrne uh, wrote the book. He's a rock guy, talking heads, if you know. And so I'm reading about music, and uh, you know, I didn't expect to learn anything about calling races. And then he starts talking about the aspects of music itself. Tempo, pitch, tone, dynamics. And I go, yeah. Tempo is the distance between musical notes and Tempo in speaking is the distance between words. And you can convey a more frantic sense as you do in music, as opposed to an adagio, which is very slow, to a uh, oh, pizzicato, very, very fast. So you start out a race. I'm talking slowly, in one little pacing between the words. And then when they go around the far turn, I get those words shorter. And then the first words start getting faster. And, that, blah, blah. and just that tempo. Yes, that's it. And so I started using that in a race call. Who'd have thought that I'd learn anything about calling races from David Byrne? No relation to Sean, I'm quite sure. <laughs> Twyla Tharp, a choreographer. I know nothing about dancing, so what the heck? Let's read about Twyla Tharp. It was a book called The Creative Habit. She's a dancer, a choreographer. I learned a tremendous amount from reading that book about how to be creative. And one of the biggest things that she said, here's the, one of the great dance choreographers of all time, and into her 70s, she was at that ballet bar every day. Practice, practice, practice every day. Because you gotta learn a little stuff really, really well until you'll be able to free yourself up for more creative activity. Then I read a book about the brain. Lord knows I need to read a book about the brain. <laughs> but it was a book, a biology book, basically. And as I was getting older, and, and I did not pick up this book for any particular reason whatsoever, the more you read about all sorts of different stuff, you do not know where the inspiration will come from. Read the book, and it's very technical, biology. And it's about how repetition makes memory easier. And it's biological. You have neural pathways in your brain that through repetition actually get wider and the electrochemical impulses travel faster through that neural pathway. Sounds like I actually know what I'm talking about, doesn't it? <laughs> but that's how it works. And so when you memorize horses, that's the key to being a racetrack announcer. That's what makes it different than being a baseball announcer. You have to memorize the color of the silks that the jockeys wear, associate those silks with the name of a horse, and you better damn well know them right. So habit is what makes this memory process go faster. So tie your shoes. Gosh, first few times you did it, it was pretty hard, wasn't it? But now, I mean, you could do it with your eyes closed and, uh, you know, writing, writing with one hand. You could, and that's how easy it is to 
uh, tie your shoes now. It's because of habit. So I decided, now I'm about 60 years old, and I can't remember quite as well as I did when I was 30. So I decided to memorize things absolutely in the same way. Repetitive, <coughs> habit, every race memorized in the same pattern. So horse A, horse B, horse C. I would say horse A's name three times. Horse B's name three times. Horse C's name three times. Then I would go A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, A, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, and then go on to horse number four, four, five, and six. And I kept on repeating that until it became such a habit that my memory got better. Well, where do they teach you that? At the racetrack announcer school? You got to read. Go out there and, and read all sorts of stuff. You have never, you don't know where inspiration is going to come until you go out and find it. And I think that's the best way to find it. I read another book about, and this was invaluable, about rhetoric. Rhetoric is the science of convincing people to your way of thinking through speech. And so there are a couple different rhetorical oh, tropes, I suppose you could call them, short rhetorical forms, like alliteration, okay? To make things sound better. When things sound better, people listen better. So in rhetoric, you try to make things sound good. One of these uh, tropes is alliteration. Repeating the same letter, uh, first letter of a word, uh, one, two, three, right uh, in consequence, uh, in sequence. So there was a horse, was in one of the, another one of these jokers that wanted to name a horse like Yake okay, Mikadola. He named the horse Flat Fleet Feet. <laughs> I got a good one day in the test stakes at Saratoga. As Flat Fleet Feet flies four furlongs and 44 and four. <laughs> now that's alliteration. And that what is one of the things that make a, makes a good uh, call. A syndeton, it's another one where you uh, eliminate the expected. So in other words, uh, you would say cigar, you normally say cigar takes the lead. But in asyndeton, you would just say cigar, the lead. Okay, you take words out. Polysyndeton is another one of these tropes. And you say the same thing over and over and over. Cigar runs by Secretariat. Cigar runs by Seattle Slough. Cigar, run, you just keep on saying one, one, one after the other, and then you say, and cigar runs to the lead, and cigar runs to win. That's polysyndeton. There's, there's all sorts of these uh, different matters, but I would have never, maybe I subconsciously did these things, maybe I didn't, uh, but once you know what you're doing and examine what it is you're trying to do and make discoveries about things you had never thought of before, that's when you can excel. You do that, and you work hard, you get a few breaks. Um, and so I guess in, in closing, there's just, well, before, we have one more call. That's right, yeah, one more call I'd like to show you. This is my last one, actually, that I ever did. Uh, the uh, Spin Away Stakes, August 14th, excuse me, August 31st, uh, 2014. Uh, in this race, I used uh, what is called a neologism. That is another rhetorical trope. Uh, neologism is making up a word. Uh, Reaganomics is not a word, it's a neologism. Neo, new logism, word from the Greek. Uh, Obamacare is a neologism, uh, whatever. Uh, so I had uh, a couple of neologisms uh, in my book, uh, and I finished my last uh, call with a made-up word. <laughs> That's me up there. <laughs> it's better with the audio, actually. Uh... 
we can try the next one down. There's probably has it in there. That was probably good. There we go. And they're off. Bonnie Kay breaking for that lead from that far outside post. Between horses, Darling Sky and Winter Dawn, and they are racing toward the front down the backstretch run. Condo Commando squeezes through an opening down toward the rail. She's looking for the lead, too. By the Moon is now running in fifth. Angela Brene has come out sixth. She's only about four lengths from the lead. The break of four back to Lady Zuzu, and Raya Binka trails the field in the slop a quarter and 22 and two. And it's Condo Commando. The leader as the field moves into the far turn. Bonnie Kay is on the chase second, by the moon on the outside. Angela Renee is trying to come on through between horses, down toward the inside, Darling Sky. Around the far turn, Condo Commando doing it easily, opening up a two and a half length lead here. Ran a half in 45 and four fifth seconds. So it's Condo Commando to catch as they come to the top of the stretch. By the moon is chasing her. Angela Renee has dropped seven lengths off the lead. Then farther back, it's Darling Sky, and it is Condo Commando splash, splashing down the stretch here at the spa, <laughs> and she's all alone for the final furlong of the spinaway. And it's by the moon, and farther back, Angela Renee coming down to the finish. Condo Commando was splash-tastic. <laughs> by the moon, second. Angela Renee third. I thought that was funny as hell. <laughs> but I would have never come up with Splashtastic if I hadn't read a book about rhetoric or whatever. Wherever that inspiration comes up, you got to come up with that stuff. I had a couple other words that I put in there. Uh, one that I had used a couple weeks before. That word was magnificent. <laughs> So we don't want to use those twice. So I just scratched that out. And luckily, uh, Splashtastic came up uh, from the subconscious. Uh, so anyway, just, uh, just in summary, uh, just three things. You know, I, I would suggest, uh, you know, you, and you guys in the program have really got a, a leg up on things. You don't have to hope that somebody hitchhiking down a street in Wisconsin is going to change your life when the right person picks them up. Uh, and hopefully you don't have to base your career on a lie. <laughs> uh, but you've got, uh, you've got a leg up because you've got the, the education. You've got the leg up, too, because I think you pretty much, if you're in this program, know what you want to do. Uh, racing is your passion. And my advice would be follow your passion uh, because if you don't, you can go anywhere from being miserable to just merely frustrated for the rest of your life. If you don't, give it a try. You know, so maybe you wanted to be the first man on the moon. Well, you tried to be an astronaut and you couldn't because you got dizzy walking upstairs. Well, at least you tried. If you didn't try, then you'd have a life of frustration and perhaps regret. So follow your, your passion and you guys are well on your way to do that. Uh, obviously work hard. Uh, you know, that business about me, you know, being a, a monk for two months before Breeders' Cup every year, probably going a little too far, but uh, I always look back on, the, on those days and I knew that I did the very best I could because I worked my butt off to try to do it. So obviously work hard. And then finally, to redux the Angel Gabriel, read, stupid, read. <laughs> Thank you very much, and I'm very happy to take any questions. All right. All right. All right. So we have time for some questions. Raise your hands. I'll get to you. We'll have the mic so Tom can see you because you are getting older. No, oh, you're not getting any younger. <laughs> <laughs> can you talk about your famous quote? Uh, of the fog, the fog race. Oh, yeah. Uh, from time to time, we get foggies, particularly at Aqueduct. It's right on Jamaica Bay and uh, in New York, and it gets foggy there. And I love the fog calls because you can screw up all you want. Nobody's going to blame you. They can't see what's going on. So I, you know, that's one of those opportunities where you can treat it with a sense of humor. So I remember one, I had any number of fog calls, but one, one time it was so... 
and you couldn't see anything. You couldn't see a hand in front of your face. And so they're going down, the, and they're going down the back stretch of aqueduct. Oh, what a beautiful sight, ladies and gentlemen! Horses in full flight. Oh, did you see that? Oh my God, that's a you know. So, uh, yeah. Who's next? I just want to thank you for a great memory. Uh, I decided a perfect gift for my wife's 40th birthday was to take her to the track at uh, Saratoga. Mm -hmm. And the last race, it's 1998, my greatest day as a better, I had a 70 to 1 shot, came up from Kentucky, ran the last race, and I repeated your call hundreds Don't of tell times. me that horse's name was Slam Bean off. No, Skullbuster. Skullbuster. And your okay. call. I still get goosebumps about because you let said me, let me tell you in something. the middle of the track at 70 to 1, it's skull buster. I mean, you drew it out. I'll tell you one I thing. I that horse. It always, it always sounds better when you win. <laughs> <laughs> Funny how that works. Yeah. You had a question over here. Well, who's next? Back here. Tom, if you could close your eyes and be in the booth or on the roof at any any locale that you've worked or been to, not not necessarily on a on a premier race day, but it could be. But what where where would you put yourself? Uh, one of two places, actually. Uh, I actually called the Arc de Triomphe uh, a number of times uh, in English, not in French, and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but that's something when you stand up there at Longchamp and it's in the, Longchamp is kind of like the central park of Paris and then you're, you're looking over uh, this beautiful setting in the park and there's a windmill, the, the Moulin uh, at the top of the stretch and then you look over and there you see the church of Saint-Cour, uh, Saint Sacred Heart, Sacre Coeur. Sacre -Coeur. And, uh, and then there's the Eiffel Tower, and, the, and you just, you know, you stand on top of there and it makes you feel pretty good about yourself. And then at the Curra in uh, Ireland, uh, and I'm Irish, I'm actually an Irish citizen, and uh, that's pretty cool to stand up there and just see that vast, vast uh, expanse of green. We had a question back here. Um, this gentleman wanted to know about the Haas. About what? De Haas. Oh, De Haas. Okay. Uh, De Haas was a, a, the Breeders' Cup mile. I'm going to get the years wrong. Uh, but he won the Breeders' Cup mile, trained by the quirky Michael Dickinson. And, uh, and then he got injured, and he was off for an entire year. And uh, it's now two years after he's had his last race, in which he won the Breeders' Cup mile. And uh, the people at the Breeders' Cup said, you can't, he wanted to run the horse in, in the Breeders' Cup mile that year again. And he said, you can't do that. You've you got to have a prep race for him. He goes, I don't need a prep race. You not, we're not going to let him in the race if you don't. Okay, so we put him in some little racy jog run. And so he comes back. And now to, to do that was remarkable. And when he uh, uh, won, I said it was the greatest comeback since Lazarus. <laughs> uh, I'm not so sure if I had that written down or not, but I thought it was pretty damn clever, actually. <laughs> Other questions for Tom? Donna. I can just stand up. Okay. Um, so right. Stand up! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming. This is Donna Brothers, by the way. Hi, so, Tom, you were, um, went from not being allowed to call the finish line, or call the finish, to calling some really close ones, like Tis Now and the Classic. So were there any that you got wrong? Or were you always right, no matter how close? Uh, sorta. <laughs> um, in the Breeders' Cup, uh, High Chaparral, and uh, who was the other horse? It was a dead heat. Yep. Uh, st st what was it? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, anyway, I, I think I called High Chaparral. And I said, maybe, maybe, it really looks close. It looks like High Chaparral. I kind of backed off that a little bit. And it was a dead heat, so I wasn't completely wrong. And then uh, I called a uh, harness race once, uh, which turned out to be a dead heat. And I called the wrong, uh, a horse that wasn't the complete winner. Uh, and then what almost was the end of my life, 
I called a horse the winner in the Travers. Might have been Will's way. Uh, and then I looked at the replay and I went, your life is over. <laughs> You're done. Thank God he won by and you know, uh, an indecipherable amount. Yeah, you remember those every time. I, I, I know I do. Any other questions for Tom? I, I want to finish with one more question I'm supposed to ask about the story of Thunderstone. <laughs> oh, Thunderstone, okay. Uh, so you guys probably remember Thunderstow and the Derby. Uh, so he's a horse from uh, United Arab Republic, uh, UAE, excuse me, United Arab Emirates. And so he had never been on a sloppy track and he'd never been in front of uh, 165,000 screaming maniacs. And so they open the gates and Thunderstow is off and he's crazy. He's buck jumping, throwing his jockey, just completely losing it. I'm a part owner of a horse called Always Dreaming, okay? So we're in the paddock, and don't have time to go up to the seats and whatever, so if you're familiar with Church Announce, there's a tunnel uh, that leads from the paddock to the track. So I'm out there, and um, I'm in the tunnel, and I'm watching the race on TV, and it's the first time I see him come around, you know, I see the horse's heads and whatever, to, okay, and, uh, and then all of a sudden, there's this screaming and yelling, get out of the way, get out of the way, ah, ah, and, the, and, the, and the outrider's there, and they open up the, the gap that leads to the track, and in comes this huge animal with these big, big teeth <laughs> and these big, big eyes, and he's, in, he's incensed, and, and they're, get out of the way, get out of the way. So I'm there, and I, by the way, horses scare me to death. <laughs> I'm allergic to horses. I love horses in my own way. I love to describe their feats and accomplishments, but I don't like to be near them. They just scare me. In comes this horse, I go, ah, and I'm pinned up against the wall, and he comes around and turns his butt right at me, and he's gonna kick me and kill me. <laughs> so I push his butt end out this way, he turns around, and they rush him off into the paddock. And I go, oh my God. <laughs> And the Kentucky Derby's being run. <laughs> okay? And so I go to a girl next to me, you know, who was unfazed by the whole thing. She's about this big. And, uh, uh, oh, my God. And I go, oh, my God. Where's always dreaming? Now they're at the top of the stretch. And she goes, he's in front. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's how I won the Kentucky Derby. <laughs> Legendary. All right, thank you. Before you run off, I want to remind you we're going to do this one more time. We're going to do it on November 13th with sports wagering and horse racing. We're going to have Representative Adam Kenning, who's joining us tonight. He'll be on the panel, along with Bill Knopf from Mount Park and John Walsh from uh, Hawthorne. Mark Midland will be the moderator that night. Same bat time, same bat channel, 5.30. On November 13th. So we'll see you all then. Thank you all very much for coming tonight. And thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thank you.